All righty. Well, thank you for joining us tonight for KevCam. Glad to have everybody here tonight. Um, my name is Ken Merritt. I am one of the senior application engineers here at SolidCam. I'm also a partner manager. And I'll be doing the uh, the show for you tonight. Uh, I think Kevin is out for various different reasons. Uh, he may or may not get back in time to join us tonight. We'll see how that happens. But I want to thank everybody for joining us. And I'll go through uh, just a few of the uh, housekeeping rules before we get started here. Um, we keep everybody on mute. Uh, those of you who have been following KevCam are probably very familiar with this. But uh, if you have any questions, there is a questions area in the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar control panel. And if you would type your questions in there, I will try very hard to kind of keep an eye out for questions over there. And just to get started, if you would, uh, just everybody let me know uh, that you're hearing me and that you're seeing my screen. You should be seeing our web page uh, up in the browser on the screen right now. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and type in. Just let me know. Uh, that you're seeing that. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And it uh, looks like it's coming through from most of the other guys as well. I appreciate that very much. Okay. All righty. Well, we are recording tonight's session, and Kevin's pretty good about getting these up on YouTube pretty quickly. So uh, if you want to follow back up on what we talked about tonight, that would be the place to find it. For those of you who are not familiar too much with what's, you know, how this all works, we have this on our website. There's a KevCam Night School, and you can just click into here. And of course, if you missed one, you can always get to it on YouTube here. And any questions that you have uh, after this is uh, over, after the session is finished, just go ahead and email those to uh, kevin.rankel at solidcam.com, and he will try to answer all those questions. Uh, try not to put questions into the YouTube because he doesn't check in there very often uh, for what's going on. It's much easier to go directly to his uh, email address. All right, so with that said, let's talk about what we're going to be going over tonight. We're going to be covering uh, what we call rotary machining. And this is a four-axis function. What you're looking at here on the screen is basically a simple uh, rotary die and I'm showing the stock on it right now. Uh, done this with a set of configurations, so I'll go ahead and switch this over to the main configuration for you so you can kind of see this. And this is kind of like a cookie cutter type of part that uh, it rolls and either prints or cuts out shapes. So this will kind of give you an idea of what we're planning on cutting tonight. You can kind of see what's going on here. And these kinds of parts tend to, um, they give a little difficulty to some cam systems, but solid cam has some great ways of handling this, and that's what we're going to go through tonight and talk to you about. So as you see, I'm up on here on the solid cam multi-axis toolbar. You can also get to this from the right click, add milling operation, and come down to rotary machining here, all the same places. Now I've already gone ahead and put a tool path in here right now, and I want to show you a little bit about what we're doing. So. Let's launch the dialog, and let me get this all set up on screen here so you can kind of see everything. Rotary machining is, is the idea of basically either driving the tool along the rotary axis, incrementing the rotation, or some people prefer for you know, look and appearance to drive the tool path around the rotary and do a step across the axial. And solid cams rotary machining allows you to do both of those. So we're going to start out with rotary machining here. Coordinate system allows us to define the coordinate system that we're working in. As you can see, this, this is on an A stage rotary. And in the geometry uh, dialog area, we have the strategies starting with the ability to go along or around the part. Now I've selected model one. Um, you can choose your target, depends on how you set it up. Um, this particular one, I wanted to capture both the rotary barrel and all of the add-on features that were modeled into this part. And so we've got that selected. Now, to start off with, I want to talk just a little bit about these two options right here, the offset and the uh, side shift. Now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and show you something. You can get to this information very, very easily. 
You come into our help documentation under the multi-axis machining, come down to rotary machining, and you're going to see that this is where the area is covered, and this is where you're going to get a lot of information about each of these characteristics. So we'll just go ahead and slide that off screen here for a little bit, and we'll come back and talk about uh, what these do. Now the offset variable is a way of actually offsetting the surfaces that you're going to cut. So if you wanted to leave a little bit of stock, just a general surface offset, you would put your number in here. The side shift is actually, as this picture shows, a way of pushing the tool off center. Now sometimes that can be very valuable in coming up on you know the side of a piece instead of trying to hit it from a radial, okay? And so that can be a way of, of getting the tool off to the side a little bit where you're using more of the bullnose radius if you're using a bullnose instead of using the center of the tip. Okay, so that's a kind of a clean way of doing that. And I'll show you in just a moment uh, how that works and what that looks like. Now, in this particular operation, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the operation on. Right now, we've got it set up to do a cut along the axis. Okay. And there's a couple of things that I want you to notice about this. Notice this extends off the edge on both sides, okay? And that's been using the option for min-max from machining surface. Now, to give you kind of an idea of what I'm talking about, let's do a quick simulation on this and just kind of bring the tool in. And what you'll notice with no shift or, or side edge, anything on there, we're working directly on the radial is where the tool's coming into play. Okay, I'll drop out of that for just a moment, and we'll leave it in the same view orientation. And I'm going to go ahead and set a side shift of one in here. Recalculate that tool path. And then what you'll notice is when we go back into simulation, you'll notice that the tool comes in at the same radial alignment, but shifted one inch off of the center so that it's now working more on the tip of the tool or the tip of the nose radius it is here than, than the center of the tip of the tool, okay? So that's what that shift does for you. It gives you a real easy way of moving that off. Let's go ahead and set that back to zero. Um, if we were to offset this, if you kind of pay attention to where the tool path is right now, let's say we do an offset of, uh, oh, I don't know, 0.05, something like that and we recalculate that tool path, you'll see this tool path all jump up and away from the surfaces uniformly all around the body. Now this takes just a little bit of time as it cuts through these. Um, just to give you an idea of performance, I'm running on a Microsoft Surface Book with the uh, performance base. This is an i7 processor and um, a two core, it's not a four core. So it's not a real desk rocket. Uh, I've got 16 megs or 16 gigs of memory in here, and it's using a uh, actually a GeForce, what they call the uh, GTX 965M graphics card. So it kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking at for performance here tonight. Uh, not using a desk rocket, just running it off of a Surface Book. Okay, coming up on the calculation here. Going through the collision checking, this is kind of a cool feature of it as well. It's looking for all of the, the pieces here to make sure that the tool is never interfering with any of those bodies. Now we've got a lot going on here because we're still shifted off, uh, or where we were shifted, it's going to recalculate it back into the center, but we're doing a 50 thousandths uh, offset of this tool path. And you'll see just shortly where that goes. Okay, and notice now everything is lifted up off of the surfaces just a little bit in covering that. So we'll go ahead and set this back to zero now. And something else I want to talk to you a little bit about, show you, and, and to make a little bit quicker calculation times, I'm going to talk about the angular units first. And if we bring this down to a zero to 90 degrees, you'll notice this will compute significantly faster because now it's only doing one degree increments at 90 degrees instead of the full 360. And so you'll see this compute very, very quickly and drive the tool path on just a quadrant section of this roller.
Okay, and as you can see, the toolpath is now generated over here. Now, what I want to talk about next is the min-max versus the user-defined. User-defined gives us an ability to really control where the toolpath is lining up. Now, as I was showing you earlier, notice that the toolpath is extending off of the end, and what that means is that the the bull nose edge of the tool, the nose radius of the tool, will actually kind of roll over this edge in this configuration when you're using full min-max. But if we set this up so that we can run from the, the start point being, um, let's go ahead and rotate this over here and pick up this edge where our coordinate system is, which would be the zero, and we'll, we'll accept that. And then we're gonna pick up the coordinate system for the end, which is gonna be negative 9.8 such, okay? Now, if we run that and calculate, What you're going to notice is the tool pass is going to pull back into the center of the tool running directly to this edge, so it won't be rolling the nose radius over the edge anymore. Okay, and you can see that right here. Okay, so very nice control of moving that tool up here, and one of the things you can kind of see here is you'll notice even though the surface here is a little is is actually kind of sloping up, notice there's a slight step in the tool path here. What that is is as the nose radius of the tool begins to roll up on this edge, then the center of the tool rolls comes out to here in a straight orientation from there on out. Now there's a couple of things I want to work with here and, and show you how this works. I'm going to change this dynamic just a little bit, and I'm going to say that instead of starting at the full extent of this, I want to start from, for instance, this end point right here, okay? And I want to go to the end point right here, okay? We'll say okay to that. Go ahead and recalculate this. And once again, quick calculation, it's going through. This is gonna change the dynamics of where the extent of this tool path is run to, okay? And as you, can, as you can see, because of the way that I selected the direction, it also changed the orientation of the rotation. Again, now if you wanted to change this back, or you could either select those points in the other direction, or you can put a negative 90 in here and roll it back over on the other side. And that actually looks like it's going to go all the way around 270. So um, probably wanted to start this over at negative 90 and come up to zero. My bad. Okay. And so you can kind of see what that did. That rolled it around here. Let's try that from negative 90 up to zero. And you can kind of see how these parameters impact uh, the calculation of the toolpath based on the order in which you select your start and end. And notice that when I first did it, I did from this end to there, but when I went back and picked it again, I went from here to here. So I changed the direction of that selection, okay? So that's kind of how all that works. Um, let's go ahead and set this back to the min-max, and um, we'll just go ahead and set this back to the 0 to 90. And then I'm going to go ahead and change this to around and show you what that does. All right, now this is going to go, again, the full body, and it's going to cut. The direction of the cut is going to be following the rotary or preferencing the rotary instead of preferencing the linear, okay? And so uh, for doing rotary dies like this or, in some cases, doing um, 
things like uh, jewelry is, is one of the things that this gets used for in a lot of cases. Um, anything where you're needing to wrap things around an axis and yet do full-on three-dimensional toolpath functionality, this is a great way of, of, of achieving that type of toolpath. Okay. Now, I do want to talk a little bit. I'm going to set this back to along because there's some things I want you to see in here. And I want to talk just a little bit about the different types of links and, and how we're controlling all this. Okay, and our toolpath parameters, um, one of the things, and I guess I should walk through some of the other things here real quickly. Uh, tool selection is just like you're used to seeing with the rest of the product. Um, levels is very similar to any of the other things you'll see in HSS or in any of the multi-axis functionality. We're using a clearance cylinder today. And we can identify uh, the rotary axis of that cylinder with the tool axis control. I'll show you that in just a moment. But we also have these controls here for managing the distances that the tool moves. Okay. Now, you can kind of see here we've got an entry and we've got an exit over here. So I want to come in here and, and change the entry value or actually show you what's going on with this. Notice the entry value is longer on the entry safety. It's at 0.4 than what it is over here on the exit where we're at 0.1, okay? Now that is how this works. This value here determines when the tool is gonna change from the rapid to the Z feed and then shift into the feed rate. Now, I want you to kind of see what we're doing here and show you how that works. I've got 40 inches for cutting feed, 20 inches for Z feed, and 400 inches for uh, the retract feed. So we're going to put this into simulation, and I want you to kind of watch the numbers here in the feed rate as we step this in. You'll notice that we're wrapping at 1,700 inches a minute on this machine. We're coming down to that safety position. And when we hit that safety position, we're going to change the next move is going to go from 17 to the 20 inches a minute. That is that Z feed move. Okay. Also, I want you to notice where it, it comes in here. See how it's coming in and putting the tangency of the nose radius right on the edge of that part there. And then it's going to wrap that edge as it comes around. Okay. So that next move is going to move up to that 40 inches a minute. So that's how those retract feeds the retract positions all work together for you there in the levels page. This retract distance here, if you kind of look at the picture, this gives you a real clear indication of what this is. If there is a tool vector change in how this pulls out, then this is the distance that the tool will retract at the retract feed rate um, before any tool vector change occurs. Okay, and then it transitions into full rapid move at that point, okay? Obviously, the identification here of the tool of the radius for the cylinder for retract can be handled. And of course, we can do also rapid retracts instead of using the 400. Now, toolpath parameters gives us an area where we can control the surface quality and we can identify our cut tolerance slider like we, you're used to seeing. We can also identify the maximum step over, scallop, and the step angle. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that these two are grayed out. And that's because we're in the along function right now. And so the step angle is what controls this. And this is actually the angle that the tool increments around. In this case, one degree increment. Notice, remember we were in the geometry page, we were set for zero to 90. And when we calculated, Notice that when it calculates, I did that really fast, so I need to change something to make that kind of change out there. Um, let me go back into toolpath parameters and we'll change the tolerance just slightly and recalculate that. What I want you to see is the 91 steps. Okay, so we're slice and it's counting up from zero to 91. That's the 90 degree section at one degree increments. Okay. OK, 
Okay, now if we go back to our geometry page and we change this to the around function, then you'll notice in the toolpath parameters that the maximum step over and the scallop are actually activated now and the angle step is turned off. And so if we wanted a maximum scallop height or a scar sorry, a maximum step over, but we want to establish a scallop, maybe we want to put in a uh, 0 0.001, for instance, scallop height. And we can ca calculate that. Um, there we go. It shifted it a little bit there. So for that scallop height that I set in there, this value had to be higher. Now this is how many step overs it would take to do the entire distance across here at that rate. Oops, slid that off the screen there, sorry. So that kind of gives you an idea how that works. All right, now, um, tool axis control, this is where in this case, it's only a four axis function. It is, it's the rotary machining. So you can identify the rotary axis, so it depends on what you're using for a machine. Like I said, in this case, we're lined up on an A axis rotary, so we're rotating about the X axis. Now you also have the ability to control what they call the interpolation um, angle steps, all right? And this is in a single step, along the tool path, what is the maximum angle that the tool vector can change? And that helps in, in some cases where you get a real tight corner where you've got an awful lot of angular change uh, in the rotary. You may want to subdivide that down into smaller steps so that those angles aren't such radical flips of the rotary, okay? And that makes it work a lot better. Back to the toolpath parameters page for just a moment. I want to talk just a little bit about um, the sorting options as well. One of the things you'll see when you're set up for a round, you'll have zigzag one way and spiral. Uh, when we're set up for a long, you'll only have zigzag in one way because of course we can't spiral if we're working along the length of the cut. Now let's go ahead and, and redo this in the, z in the zigzag motion because I want to step into starting to talk just a little bit about the links and how we control um, the links that we want to set up. And Okay, so we've got that going along. Now we notice, and actually what I want to do also make this a little easier to see, I'm going to switch this back over here. And we're going to go back to uh, the starting edge here and the ending edge over here because I want you to be able to see uh, exactly what I'm talking about here. All right, now this is going to bring those edges right back into the edge of this die. And it'll give us an easy way of looking at this link move and showing what that is and how that is controlled. All right, now the other thing I want to do here is I'm going to go back into the um, quality parameters and I'm going to step this out just a little bit. Notice we've got these little green lines in here now kind of hard to see, but there are a little green line that is the connector between the steps. I'm going to kick this out to three degrees. This is going to move the steps out a little bit further. And notice now we've got a bunch of retracts going on. I want to talk a little bit about what that is and, and how to manage that. What these are is the, it's the link between the slices. So when we go into our links page, you'll notice in the links page that we have the approach and retract. Now the approach and retract control the first entry and of course the last exit. And you can determine how that is supposed to run. Is it from the retract distance, the safety distance, from an incremental clearance or 
straight from the clearance area. Typically, I like to use the clearance area because it's the first entry and the last exit. Okay. We can also determine whether or not to use lead-ins or lead-outs. Now, if we choose to use a lead-in, the three-dot button here gives us the opportunity to choose whether we want to use the default lead-in, which can be assigned, or whether we want to take advantage of several other methods for leading in and leading out of a cut. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and cancel back out of that and turn this back to don't use because I want you to see just the exact link. I don't want to have a lead in in here confusing things. Um, just so you know though that default lead in lead out can be assigned here so that this is what is being used when you use that check mark for the default. Now back to the links page we talked about the approach retract. When we talk about the links area, this has two separate areas that we control how the tool moves on gaps along the cut and on links between slices. This is very, very powerful because we can determine what size, whether it's a percentage of tool diameter or an actual value, identifies a small gap. And then we can choose on the small gaps, how do we want to move the tool? Do we want to go direct, which would be, you know, just a straight movement to it, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Safety distance, clearance area, follow the surface, do a blended spline, various, various different ways that we can do this, okay? Now, you'll notice something that because I stepped it out, um, in the links between slices, the small move, is considered a size percentage of the step over. Okay, so once this started stepping out, it became too big of a move for it to handle with the follow surface or the direct or anything like that because it became a large move. It's over this value. But now I'm going to crank this value up to 300. Let's see what happens. Notice now we got back to direct movements because 300 times the value of the step over brought this distance back into what would be considered a small move and it no longer needs to go to the clearance area. Now let's talk about the difference in this type of movement. Okay. I'm going to bring this in here and roll right up on the edge so you can kind of see it there. And notice that this move is a straight line move from the departure of one slice to the entry of the next slice. But if I change this to follow surface, you'll notice this line takes on the characteristics of the surface. It's, it's more of a curved line now, actually following the shape of this model. Okay. Now that can be something that you need to pay attention to depending on the shape of what you're cutting. A direct may actually cause a gouge. So you gotta kinda watch out for that and be careful. Another one that's a very popular one is to use the blended spline. Now the blended spline gives us the ability to actually come off of this and back in. And as you can see here, it keeps or helps to keep the machine moving in a very uniform and tangential motion so that it's nice and smooth movement. It's not having to stop make a direct 90 degree turn, stop again, make another 90 degree turn, and reaccelerate. This actually keeps it in a real nice smooth movement. Notice the start and stop points though are still right at the edge of the surface versus if we put this in min-max, it's gonna allow that tool to roll the edge and then do that link move. Ah, that's why I moved it over here. <laughs> My angle's off for that orientation. Okay, so you can kind of see now, notice the blended spline, and this is kind of critical to see. Look at the direction of this link move. Because this final move actually rolls the edge for the trailing nose radius to, to come over this edge, the direction that is tangent is this way instead of the other way instead of coming straight out. 
notice in this case that that blended spline comes straight directly off that tangency movement okay so those are kind of some of the things that you want to pay attention to i also want to talk just briefly about um arc fitting and tolerances and all the things that we're doing in here some people are a little bit confused about what this cut tolerance actually does and so i want to talk a little bit about that and talk about um, you know what are the benefits the pros and cons of doing arc fitting and what are maximum minimum distance functions okay so let me do a little bit of whiteboarding here for you just to talk about this let me get my mouse off the screen and if let's say we have a, uh, a convex curvature okay and we've got linear segment moves that are coming up like this and then like this and then I'm a terrible artist, sorry, that was a bad draw. Let's take that line out of there. Um, and let's come back across here and then back across here. So the tangency points on the external are going to be where a faceted tool path is gonna drive along that surface. This distance here, from this point here to this point here, is considered your tolerance. It's also known as a chordal deviation. Okay, now what happens, and sometimes this is a little easier to see on a concave curve, because on the concave curve, that chordal deviation is actually the vertices connect with the curve, and the chordal deviation is here in the middle. Now, if I were to use, and let me drop this back out again and talk about these max distances, if I use a maximum distance function, then I can tell it how far I want each of those segments to be, regardless of chordal deviation, as long as they're inside and they don't violate the chordal deviation tolerance. And so back to our whiteboard, this could actually break it up into uniform segmented movements through here that would be much closer to the actual curve and give us a smoother tool path, okay? Now, one of the things that has been studied over the years in high-speed machining is the uniformity of movement. And, and that's, why, that's why these are in here, because you can actually cause a machine to move significantly faster and smoother by breaking it up into smaller line segments. And so we give you the ability to do that here. Now, arc fitting can become a very interesting thing to think about and to decide whether or not you want to work with. There's a couple of things to play with. Some people like arc fitting because it reduces some of the point-to-point -point code down to G2, G3 arcs. But now in a 3D or a four-axis situation, how does that work? Well, if we're using on center, remember what we could do is we could break this into coordinate planes and if we think about um, where we're at with this model, and it won't let me move it because I'm inside the dialogue, um, the coordinate orientation puts us in the cardinal planes for those arcs. So your G17, G18, G19 planes. Depending on your machine, that's you know going to be your, your XY is generally the G17. Uh, G18 can either be the XZ or it can be the YZ, depending on the manufacturer of the machine. Um, but either way, think about the XZ plane on this. The XZ plane, if I'm driving the tool directly down the center, would be a very good place to be able to drive arcs in G2, G3. And so if I set this up to drive in the coordinate plane, and I give it an arc fit, and I give it a factor for deviation between point 0.1 and 2, then this can give me very clean arcs that are joined instead of line segments. Okay. Now, the thing to think about, though, and I want you to understand this, remember the controller has to then linearize that G2 back to point to point. So sometimes it's kind of a redundancy. If it's a matter of toolpath size because of memory restrictions in the machine or something like that, then arc fitting can be very valuable. If you're looking for smoothness, you're kind of defeating the purpose by arc fitting because using the maximum distance will allow you to create a tool path that is very, very uniform and very smooth in its, in its flow. But then if you arc fit it, 
you could be changing that dynamic and then the controller is going to relinearize it anyway and it's not necessarily going to get linearized to those controlled distances that you've established so think about that if you can manage the the point to point with the size of the code that's always the better way to do it especially if the machine has high speed capabilities because the shorter the line segment this is one of those things that's very interesting to look at if i've got line segments on an exaggerated point that move from here to here to here to here what slows the machine down is the line segment distance relative to the vector deviation angle and so if we reduce the line segment lengths so that the line segment change of direction there's less arc deviation on these because the line segment is shorter then the machine doesn't have to do as much acceleration deceleration and you'll get a much smoother movement and you'll get a much better throughput of feed rate okay so anytime you're incorporating rotary motion along with linear motion one of the things you want to think about is keeping that very very smooth and very coordinated okay all right, so we've covered the geometry selections, tool selection we know, levels, toolpath parameters. Uh, we've talked about the links and the lead-ins and such. Gouge checking, for those of you that have been around and seen our any of our uh, HSS toolpath or any of our five-axis simultaneous toolpath, you should be familiar with this section. This gives us the ability to control gouges within four segments or four methods, if you will. By enabling it, we can choose what we want to check and what we want to check it against. And then we can also determine how we want to handle a collision for that avoidance. And in each of these uh, ideologies of strategies for how to handle that tool movement, we have several different modifiers that allow us to handle a multitude of different approaches to that gouge avoidance scheme. Now remember that you can also do you know, multiple gouge avoidance schemes so that um, you don't wind up running into other things as well. So for instance, um, you could do the first gouge scheme as just the tool tip against the drive surfaces and just retract the tool along the tool axis vector if there is an interference. In your second gouge tick, check, for instance, I may want to check the tool shaft against a series of check surfaces, and I may want to tilt the tool using lead lag or side tilt to get it away from the wall. So the first thing it's going to do in gouge one is look for interference with the drive surface. Then it's going to follow back through again and look for interference with the tool shaft. And then in a third gouge check, we might want to establish checking for the holder against check surfaces and in this case if the holder runs into it we may want to say just stop the toolpath calculation or trim and relink the toolpath calculations to avoid that move that causes that interference so the cool part about this gouge checking functionality is that you can set up multiple schemes that are subsequent to each other and actually create a very very powerful way of making sure that the tool is not interfering with either the surfaces that you want to cut, surfaces that are adjacent to those surfaces or near those surfaces, or even potentially uh, components of the machine itself that you want to make sure you're not bumping into. Okay. You also have the ability to set your clearance data here. So you can set up, you know, what you want to keep clear. We also have a function called roughing and more. Now roughing and more gives us an ability to take the same toolpath that we're looking at here and utilize it as a way of roughing this part down. Now remember, the stock that we've got on this is thick enough to cover this, but what if we can't take this full depth of cut without breaking the tool or without stressing the tool too much? If we went into multi-pass, then we have an ability to use multiple passes to come in from the side, okay? 
If we then use look at stock definition, we can avoid air cuts, we can do things of that nature so that we can really take advantage of the stock that we've described over this. And then there's also mirroring of the toolpath as well in here. So there's a lot of different ways that we can strategize this um, with the toolpath parameters and the, the geometry page. Remember, we can do an offset. So we could offset this up, well, let's say even 80 thousandths or 90 thousandths. Let's use that for an even increment. And then offset the next one, Do the, just do a copy and save, and offset the next one 60. Save and copy again, offset the next one 30, and we can walk those toolpaths down into the level that we want to cut, only taking 30,000 depth of cut each time instead of taking the entire length of cut here in one swipe. So there's a lot of different things you can do in here to make that work. And then especially if you're doing that offset and you combine that offset with stock definition and tell it to avoid air cuts, then in the areas where the stock offset would put you above the stock, it'll avoid that air cut and go directly over to the next cut. So it's some pretty cool stuff that you can do here. Um, be very interesting to see who's using this kind of stuff and see how they like it. But I've seen uh, a lot of stuff in the past with this that is very, very functional. So at this point, I want to kind of open this up to question and answers. I hope we've given you kind of a good overview of what rotary machining is all about. And um, I'll just open a forum here. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them into uh, the questions area, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Okay. Well, I've got some good comments coming in. One of them's roughing and more is fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, anybody else have any any questions about what we covered tonight? I'm give it just a moment here. Okay, while we're looking for a few more questions to come in, I want to talk just briefly about a few things. Um, let's go ahead and bring this back on screen here for a moment and talk just a little bit about our KevCam classes and the way we do this. Um, Kevin normally runs these, Kevin Rankle, uh, one of our uh, really, really good application engineers. Um, he usually handles all this for us. He also runs the YouTube page, and there's all kinds of videos up there that I'm recording this tonight, so this one will go up there if you want to go back and review it. But we also look for you guys to kind of tell us what you want to look at, what you, what do you want to see, okay? Um, We'd ask you to submit your topics or requests, and then uh, if yours is chosen, we're going to offer you a shirt and a hat, say thank you for the ideas. Um, coming up, we've got screw machining, port machining, and multi-blade machining, and those will be coming up in, in the following weeks here. Looks like we do have a couple of questions in here. Is there a way to machine along the edge of a feature? Not in rotary machining, but in simultaneous five axis, yes, there are several ways of approaching that. We can cover those uh, in a more of an offline class. If you would, go ahead and um, give Kevin a call on that or send him an email, and we can set up a personalized, uh, you know, take a look at that in that way. Um, thank you for the comment, Ronnie. I appreciate that. Uh, is there lead lag ability in this toolpath? I do not believe so because this is not a five axis toolpath. This is a four axis toolpath only. And so the idea of this is for driving around um, a four axis rotary component and getting that tool uh, to either follow along, preferencing the linear type motion, or to go around preferencing the rotary type motion, depending on, on what it is you're trying to do. So no, lead and lag wouldn't be a function of this. Um, possibly could be considered lead and lag if you're looking at a round and you're using a sidestep because then the tool would be kind of leading if you want to look at it that way. And it would depend on um, whether you are using a ball tool or a bull nose tool and how that would work. Um, Maybe offset simulates. 
I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Jeff. Um, yeah, exactly. The, the side, well, the offset wouldn't, but the sidestep would. I think I understand what you're saying. The offset would kind of behave like a lead if you were using that, that side step. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's a good way to do that. Um, okay. Uh, I haven't seen any other questions come in there for a little bit. So, if that's, uh, if that's everything, then we'll go ahead and close this out tonight. Thank you guys for, for attending tonight. I really appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed this session of KevCam about rotary machining. And again, if you have any questions on this, please feel free to send them in to Kevin at, uh, at kevin.rankle at solidcam.com. His last name is shown right here on the page. So it's just kevin.rankle at solidcam.com. And if he needs to get me involved in something, he'll be more than happy to drive me into anything. And uh, we can answer, hopefully answer any of your questions you might have. So, you guys have a great night tonight. Again, I really appreciate you showing up. And we'll go ahead and close the class down now. Thank you. <laughs>